You doing good? Are you happy today? Amen. Well, it's quite a season that we're in, and I'm not talking about Christmas. It's uh, quite a season. We uh, basically are going to put things on pause this week for our Christmas musical. I say pause for this week because we have some people that uh, have contracted the virus, and one very important person, which is Leonel. And uh, I don't really pass to the church. He does. <laughs> but uh, uh, so we're just putting things on a little pause this week. I, I, I've been pastoring for 37 years now, and this has been the most difficult season in 37 years of pastoring is through this season. But to everything, there is a season. Amen. And we are in a season. How many have things that this week that just made you laugh? Anybody? I had a couple of things that just made me laugh this week. Uh, my wife and I had our two oldest granddaughters, Gia and Zoe, out this week. One day, or I guess, no, G I had, we had Zoe and Skye. So I was with Skye, and Skye's only not quite a year old, and I was pushing her through Walmart, and Zoe went with my wife to return something at Walmart. And while my wife was standing in line with Zoe, there was a young couple in line to return something, and they were making out in line <laughs> like only non-married people can make out like. You know what I'm talking about? They were going to town, these two. And Zoe was just, she's four. She was just <laughs> watching this spectacle going on. So all of a sudden, Molly was, saw this couple, and she looked at Zoe, and finally Zoe looked up at Molly, and she went. <laughs> that was her first experience of seeing that. And then someone in the church gave uh, my granddaughters two little dolls. And the dolls are homemade, and they're made at a senior's home. And uh, so <laughs> yesterday, Gia wanted to show me her doll. And she said, see this, Bubba? Old people make these. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, this morning, I, I really hope I don't go too deep in theology for you today. Because uh, this is a rather deep sermon this morning. Uh, the title of my message is Lessons from... Rudolph. And I didn't even realize that Rudolph is moving this morning. I didn't know it really. I thought he was just stationary. But Rudolph, either he's come alive or he's, uh, something's happened to him. But anyhow, how many know how many reindeer Santa Claus had? You say eight? Somebody say nine? Well, according to the song, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, uh, Santa has 12 reindeer. Now, in the introduction, you notice there's Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Donner, and Blitzen. That makes eight. Then Rudolph, of course, makes nine. But there's also Olive. All of the other reindeer used to laugh. That makes ten. And the eleventh is how. You know, then how the reindeer loved him. So that means there's 11. And then uh, number 12, Andy. Andy showed it out with glee. <laughs> Proof is in the song. Can you say amen? amen. If you want better jokes, you got to put more in the offering, all right? <laughs> Some lessons from Rudolph this morning. God uses people that no one else would. Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer had a very shiny nose. And if you ever saw it, you would even say it glows. That's not in the Bible, by the way. I'm not reading scripture this morning. <laughs> Rudolph had something different about him. And society has a real problem with anyone that is different. We really do. And also, the church I have watched in my lifetime has difficulty with anything that is different. I remember when I was about seven or eight years old, right around that age, uh, I was always a Beatles fanatic when I was a little kid. And when I was real little, I had uh, Beetle boots. Hopefully you're old enough to know who the Beatles are. I had Beetle boots. I, had, I wanted drain pipe pants. Remember those? To go with my Beetle boots. And I, I loved the Beatles. And so when I was real little... In church, all you had was usually just 
a, a piano or a, an accordion. That's all you had for music. And then my dad was pastoring a church, and there was a couple of young guys, and they got some guitars, so they played guitar in church, and my mother played the, the piano, and uh, I wanted a set of drums. And uh, so I started playing the drums in church when I was a little kid. Well, God bless his soul. There was, there was one board member in my dad's church, I remember, after I was playing the drums, and he hated the drums. And he would come, and he would sit in the front, and when I'd start playing the drums, he'd go like this. It was very encouraging for a young man, I'll tell you, when you're young. But I'm saying that to say this. The church has always had a difficult issue with anything that is different. And if it doesn't fit into the religious traditions, sometimes we just think we can't sanction it. Now, you would think, if you were back in the days of Rudolph, that there's something wrong with a reindeer if his nose glows. That's just not right. Any reindeer that looks like this has issues. Can you say amen? In fact, all of the other reindeer used to laugh and call them names. And they never let Rudolph join in any reindeer games. Society is full of rejection. Church, let's not be like society. Three people heard that this morning. As a church, let's not reject people. Because that's what people are feeling and receiving almost every single day of life. And I've always said that in Praise Tabernacle Church, anyone is welcome to come here. Anyone. We reject no one. Society rejects, starts when you're in preschool. It goes all the way through life. And they pick and they choose who they allow to hang in their little group. Notice the story from Luke chapter 2, verse 4. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be registered with Mary, his, wife, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger. Because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. You say, why did I read that this morning? Well, that's part of the Christmas story. But I want you to notice something. The big and the powerful were in Palestine at the birth of Christ. They were all there. There were the scholars that had great intellect. There were the rulers that had great power and great command. But God did not choose the great and the powerful to share the good news of his son's arrival on earth. That's not who he shared it with. The angels came to who? Lowly shepherds. A shepherd was looked down upon in those times. In fact, when Joseph brought his father to Egypt, he, he didn't want them to know that his dad was a shepherd. Why? Because they were the lowest of the low and they were looked down upon. It was not a king or a ruler that Jesus' earthly father became, but it was rather a carpenter by the name of Joseph. You see, God takes the simple things, the things that man looks down at, the things that man will reject, and God uses them. You might be in this room this morning, and you may have low self-esteem about yourself. You may have spiritual low self-esteem about your walk with God, but I want you to know this morning that God does not reject you. Never has. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. Think of that. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. God uses little people and God uses little things. And God uses little people sometimes to do big things. The Bible gives many exa examples. That great giant Goliath was killed by a little boy named David. 
He maybe was 14 or 15 years of age. The armies of the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other forces gathered together to fight Israel. The Bible describes it, it was like the number of a swarm of locusts, this great army. But they were defeated by Gideon and a little army of only 300 soldiers. Think of that. God takes the little to do the big. Moses was born a Hebrew. He was born a slave. And God took a slave and used a slave to lead the nation of Israel out of slavery from Egypt. That's God. Naaman was sent to Elisha to be healed of leprosy. Who did he send him with? A little servant girl. Wasn't some great king or some great ruler, some great soldier. It was a servant girl. God used a little boy to give his lunch to Jesus. And he fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. That's what God can do. God can use your life. Never ever think you're too insignificant for God. That is a lie of Satan. Little is much if God is in it. Never forget that. God uses little places also to do great work. Where did God look for a king of Israel? Where did he was replacing Saul? Where did he look? Did he look in the palace? Did he look in the army? Where did he look? No, he looked out on the shepherd field. And it was out on the shepherd field that he saw that little David. Gideon, what was he when God called him to lead that army of only 300? He was a farmer. Moses, where was Moses when God looked upon him? Moses was crying in the bulrushes. In a little ark that was made by his mother to keep him alive when all the other boys were being killed. God said, I'm going to use that little baby right there to lead my people to their promised land. The great Christian classic, Pilgrim's Progress. Do you realize that was written in a prison cell? The great evangelist D.L. Moody was won to Christ by a little shoe salesman. Those that are working this morning with the children down in Blast. That might seem quite insignificant. But you realize down there might be the next Billy Graham. It was Sunday school that brought Billy Graham to Christ. God uses little places to do work and work out his will. Never forget that. You may feel that where you are right now is nothing but a dead end. How could God ever use me where I am? God loves little places and God loves little people. You may be located at a dead end street, but God knows where you are and God knows your name. Never forget that. Let him work through you. So a lesson from Rudolph. God not only uses people that no one else would, but God also uses insignificant places. Don't miss the hand of God in insignificant things. And God will show up when you least expect it. And God will do his greatest work sometimes with the most insignificant things. Bethlehem was the place where Jesus was born. Bethlehem. I've been to Bethlehem before. Bethlehem is not one of the bigger towns in, in Israel. Uh, it's just basically a small town. The thing that brings people there is the fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So when you go there, that's their main attraction. And you go into the, this church, and uh, you're way down underneath this church building. And because, by the way, when you go to Israel, the Catholic Church built a church over every holy place. So if you go there, you got to go into Catholic Church and go down in underneath, and then they have it. So you go down in underneath, and they have this little star there, and they said, this is where Jesus was born. Could have been. But Bethlehem was where Jesus was born. And when Micah the prophet prophesied about the coming of the Messiah, notice what he says. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. You all still with me? He says this. As for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, seemingly insignificant among the clans of Judah, from you a king will emerge who will rule over Israel on my behalf, one whose origins are in the distant past. Bethlehem was insignificant. Another scripture in the Bible says, can anything come out of Bethlehem? Well, it was just a little insignificant town. We still sing, oh, little town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem, an insignificant town. It was not a metropolitan city. You see, God did not have to send his son in our day to a modern New York or Los Angeles. God didn't even have to send his son in Jesus' day to the great city of Rome. He sent it to a little insignificant 
town called Bethlehem. You see, God knows all about humble, insignificant beginnings. He knows about it. Do you know, Jesus knew what it was to be homeless. The Bible says that there was a time when Jesus had no place to lay his head. You see, God knows where you are this morning. Maybe you are in the pit of discouragement this morning. God knows exactly where you are. And God, if you'll let him, can pull you out of the pit of discouragement. You may be in a place of negativity today and you're just living negative all your life and that's all you're thinking of. Negative, negative, negative. God knows where you are. And if you let God, He can pull you out of that spirit of negativity that's gripping your life. He can do that. You may be in a place today where in your physical body you have a sickness, you have a disease, whatever it may be. God knows where you are. And God has the ability to heal you today. That's the power of God. You're not insignificant. Luke chapter 2 verse 7. We read again. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Well, why would you bring that up, pastor? Well, if you look at that word manger. Manger was not a crib or a bassinet. It was a feeding trough for animals. When you go to Israel, you'll see these all over the place. And that's what that is. That, what you're looking at, is a manger. Um, I had one tour guide in Israel one time. He said to me, he said, why do they say that Jesus was a carpenter? He said he likely was a mason. He said, you see any wood in Israel? But anyway, uh, but you'll see these all over the place. And that's what they fed the animals of. It's called a manger. So when the, ma- when the Bible says that he was laid in a manger, it's literal. They laid him in a feeding trough for animals. And then it says the swaddling cloths. Do you know that was nothing but rags? The New Living Translation says she wrapped him in snugly strips of cloth and laid him in a manger. You see, they were on the move, Mary and Joseph were. And all of a sudden, Jesus was coming. And they took whatever they had. They had a manger, and maybe there were some claws around that they had for animals, and she wrapped that child in those claws. This is where the Savior of the world was born. Think of that. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, stooped to lowliness that we might someday receive unimaginable riches. God sent His Son to live in this flesh. I have some thoughts about death and eternity, and one of my thoughts about death and eternity is that if you were to die today and go to be with God and God were to say to you, you know, if you'd like to go back, you can go back, you would say, absolutely not. You'd never want to return to the confines of your fleshly body as it is, never, with its aches and its pains with its limitations, with its part that's always just beating, 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 beating. And my, one of my granddaughters said yesterday, she was talking, she asked questions about dying. And I heard her talking to my wife. And, and she said, what, when, when you die? And she said, well, that's when you go to be with God. She said, how do you die? And she said, well, that's when your heart stops. Well, basically, this is the truth. When your heart stops, you stop. But, <coughs> excuse me, inside here, I have a muscle. And for some reason, it chooses to start beating. And for some reason, right now, it's beating. And I don't know all the details on it, but from what I've read and what I've heard, there's something that sparks within me that tells my heart to beat just before it beats. And it's beating, but one day, it will stop. I believe that if I was to go to be with God right now, and God would say, you know what, you can go back. I said, no way. I don't want to go back. But think of this. God sent His Son to live in this. And he knew what it was to suffer. He knew what it was to bleed. He knew what it was to feel pain. And yet he came to this earth. He stooped to lowliness so that we might someday have unimaginable riches. He could have been born in a palace. He could have been born in a modern hospital. But he chose an insignificant place to greet the birth of his son. You know, society has issues with things that are 
different or insignificant. I've noticed that. Jesus Christ is not quite complicated enough for a lot of people. Uh, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Savior of the world, to be born in Bethlehem, in a manger, to two insignificant young people. That's so insignificant. Many people can't accept Jesus because it seems just insignificant to them. The atheist says, well, if I can't figure out God, then he can't exist. That's almost an irrational statement to me. To say because you can't figure something out, you will not believe in it? If I could figure out God, then God wouldn't be much of a God. Because I have a finite mind. The atheist says, God needs to be more scientific. Well, they just don't understand that science and God will go hand in hand. They will. They say, I can't figure out the atom. I should say, I can figure out the atom, but I can't figure out the creator of the atom. That even doesn't make sense, ladies and gentlemen. And then religion. Religion says, if it doesn't conform to our standards, then it can't be used. Rudolph rejectors always are looking for something to fit in their preconceived box. You can't put God in a box. You can't. That's why I struggle with all the arguing over the Bible and, and the Word of God. Listen, we'll never completely understand God and the Godhead especially. It's something that's not from this realm. In fact, Samson, he used the jawbone of a donkey to do battle. Jesus, he used the illustration of sparrows to let us know that he'll take care of you and he loves you. While the kings were carried in chariots and great ships in Jesus' day, what was Jesus riding around in? He was picking up a ride with local fishermen to get to the other side of the Sea of Tiberias or the, or the Sea of Galilee. That's all he did. Too many times we miss God because it looks like it's too insignificant. Sometimes people just look for something that's so super religious and they miss God. They're looking for some thunderous religious experience, the parting of heavens. I don't know about you, but I've never heard God say, Allah. <laughs> never. I've been, you know, I've been around for 58 years now in church and I've never heard him say, Allah. Never heard that. But I have had God speak to me. I have. And you say, well, what do you mean you have God speak to you? Well, God doesn't come in that thunderous way. You see, the Jews missed their Messiah because his coming was too insignificant. He didn't come in the way that they preconceived it. And to this day, they still missed it. One day God will reveal himself to them through Jesus Christ. He will reveal them. But they missed it. You know, he was born in a manger. Isn't he supposed to come as, as the son of, of David in that lineage? Well, he did, but they missed it. They didn't even know that that little girl, that Mary, that young 15, 16-year-old girl, that she was in the line and lineage of the great King David. They didn't know that. It was too insignificant. Don't miss the insignificant things that God has to teach you something. Don't miss the laughter of a child. That should speak to you. I mean that. If a child's laughter, a little child, when they do that belly laugh, if that doesn't get you and bring joy to you, something's wrong. You know what it'll do when you hug someone that's hurting? You don't always have to have the words to say. Because likely you'll say the wrong thing. And when someone is in bereavement or someone is hurting, I have found that just to be there and put your arms around them means more than anything. I don't know about you, but it's great to be able to enjoy a sunrise. Or if you're a late riser, at least the sunset. In a simple moment of quietness, do you realize that God can speak volumes to you? 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. Then he said, do I say, he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. You know, 
Elijah, he, he was running from God, and he was basically a discouraged preacher out there in a cave, and he said, God, it would be better if I died right now. But he goes out, and he stands out there, and he's looking for a word from God. And, and sure, he's just the wind, he's just the earthquake, it's a fire. But God wasn't in any of that. That just all happened. It just happened to happen there. But all of a sudden, it was a still, small voice. Don't miss the whisper of God when he speaks to you. When I pray, I pray the way I feel to pray. And I recommend you do the same thing. Don't try to be like anybody else. Don't try to outshout someone or out oritate someone or out pray someone or pray the King James Version, you know. You don't have to do that. You pray the way you feel to pray. And I always encourage you, you come here tomorrow night, I encourage you for prayer. And I do encourage you to come from 7 to 8. You pray however you feel to pray. If you feel to come up here and stand at this altar and just pray here at this altar, sit in a pew, kneel at a, kneel at a chair, stand back by the prayer wall, walk around, pray whatever way you want to pray. I tell you what I look for when I pray. I want to hear from God. And I tell God that I love Him. And I also was convicted quite a long time ago that I need to pray to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is my prayer partner. Jesus is praying for me in heaven. He is my high priest after the order of Melchizedek. But he said, I will send you a comforter, the Holy Spirit, and he will be in you. He will be with you. And so when I pray, I also pray to the Holy Spirit. I say, Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me. I have prayed that prayer all through the corona issue that we've had over the last year and a half or better. I've said, Holy Spirit of God, give me wisdom. Help me with this. And I love it when all of a sudden... I hear a little whisper from God. I was praying in here several years ago now. I was standing over here by the prayer wall. I was walking back and forth before we had put the prayer wall up. And I remember one night I was praying for my son. Back when my son was dealing with, with his addiction issues. I didn't know where he was. And I hadn't known where he was. And I was praying. I was walking back and forth. And I was praying for my son. I said, God, where is he? What's he doing? And I remember a still small voice spoke to me. And it said this, these words to me, I'll never forget it. Just in my spirit, in my heart. It said, if you could see with my eyes, you would see your son right now. That's all I needed. Because I knew if his eyes were on the sparrow, then his eyes were on my son. Amen. It was not in the earthquake, the wind, or the fire. It was a whisper of God. For Peter, it was in the crowing of a rooster that all of a sudden he realized his sin. God uses insignificant things to do his will. He can use insignificant me, and he can use insignificant you. All we have to do is surrender to him. Lessons from Rudolph, God uses insignificant things. And thirdly, God is the ultimate vindicator. Luke chapter 2 again, verse 8. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the glory, Lord's glory surrounded them and they were terrified. Here's this angel appears to them. They're out there in the shepherd field. It's dark. They got a fire on. A little sheep in behind them. All of a sudden Angel, and the glory of the Lord is there. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You'll find the baby wrapped in snugly strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those to whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. I believe these guys all of a sudden were excited to get on the road and travel to Bethlehem. God let these simple shepherds know 
what seemed insignificant was actually a vindication for mankind. Man had become an outcast from God because of sin. But God sent His Son to vindicate us. God is the ultimate vindicator. Then one foggy Christmas Eve, Santa came to say, Rudolph, with your nose so bright, won't you guide my sleigh tonight? Then all the reindeer loved him. And they shouted out with glee, Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer, you'll go down in history. Let me read that from Romans chapter 5, verse 6. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would be willing to die for an upright person, not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Hallelujah. We were jacked up, but yet God loved us. We were unlovely, but God loved us. God's love for us vindicates us. God's love for us, that, that gives us our self-worth. Where's your self-worth come from? It's not the, the bling you have on. All that bling you have on just means you're tacky dresser. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, you're not vindicated by what kind of a vehicle you drive. You're not vindicated by where you live in Rhode Island. You're not vindicated by where you went to school or what your last name is or the color of your skin. That's not what vindicates you to give you your self-worth. Your self-worth comes in that God so loved you that he sent his son to die for you. God's love also puts you in the work of the kingdom. Do you hear what I said? God's love for you employs you into the kingdom work for God. Say, but pastor, I've got flaws in my life. God could never use you. Yes, he can. The only thing God has to use on this earth is flawed people. That's it. He has no choice. We're all flawed. So God has no choice. God's vindication kept the shepherds' fear from hindering them. Remember at first, they were fearful but after they saw the angel, and the angel said, no, don't fear not. I bring you good tidings of great joy, all people. You know, in this day is born the Savior of the world. After they saw that in the great host of, of heaven there, all of a sudden, they forgot all about their fears. They didn't even worry about their sheep. They just said, we're going to Bethlehem. God will take care of the sheep. They didn't worry about wasting their time. Oh, I don't have time to do this. They said, no. God said, go to Bethlehem, we're going to Bethlehem. They forgot all about their self-esteem, just being a lowly shepherd. Their task was to go find a baby wrapped in snugly claws and lying in a manger. Jesus also has vindicated us so that we can reach others with the message of Jesus Christ. Don't ever, 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 ever let Satan lie to you and tell you you're no good. Don't ever let him do that. You got to remember, he hates you. Satan despises you. And he wants to tell you you're no good. He, Satan is the ultimate verbal abuser. He is. He will verbally abuse you. He'll put you down. He'll like, make you think that you're nothing, that you can do nothing, that you fail God too much. He's a verbal abuser all the time. And he's also a liar. But Jesus is the ultimate vindicator. Jesus at the, asked the woman at the well for a drink of water. Then he showed her in John chapter 4 that he was the living water. Jesus asked that little boy for his lunch and fed over 5,000 people. In Luke chapter 5 verse 3, then he got, <clears throat> then he got into the, one of the boats, Jesus did, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little from land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. You say, why would you read that, Pastor? Because Jesus asked a man, will you put your boat in service of the kingdom? That's what he was asking that man. And Jesus, the Son of God, got in and said, w would you allow me to use your boat and push your boat out for me so that I could preach the gospel of the kingdom? God asks us all to take what he has given us and use it 
in the kingdom of God. Don't ever say it's insignificant. Don't ever say what I have is nothing. God has given you exactly what you need to preach the gospel. It's little tasks that God uses in the work of God, especially in the local churches. Someone has been handing out hot chocolate out there at that little booth outside every night when people are walking by. And they're listening to those Christmas carols play on our church speakers outside, walking around looking at Christmas lights. God needs some people to help with the Christmas lighting and did this year. So many people helped out. So many people help with cleanup, ushering, drive a bus, nursery. Little acts of kindness. You have no idea how big they are and what it could do to reach someone for Christ. I am here today, standing in this pulpit, pastoring this church, because a little woman went to my great-grandmother and to her house, door-to-door, selling homemade donuts during the Depression. My great-grandmother was very far from God. She didn't know God. But this little woman knocked on her door, trying to make a few cents during the Depression. And my grandmother, great-grandmother invited her in, and that little woman shared the gospel with her. I'm here today from a little woman selling donuts. I'm here today because in New Brunswick, Canada, in a place called Coles Island, it's not the end of the world, but you can see the end of the world right from there. And it's a stretch of highway and it's got a turn, but there's a little, small, little country church that sits there. And I'm here today because the pastor of that church decided that he was going to play gospel music through the belfry of that church as my dad, as a 16-year-old boy, lay in the ditch during his lunch hour because he had been putting the guardrails along the edge of the road there and stalling them, and he laid in the ditch in dinner time, and the music was playing, and the song of Hank Williams was, Are you ready to go home? Are you ready to meet him? And my dad laid there in the ditch, and he thought, I'm not ready to meet God. He was so far from God, he had no thought of God. And the man sat there in the ditch beside him, began to witness to him. My dad went and gave his life to Christ. So I'm here today because of a little woman selling donuts and a little country preacher decided that he'd put some gospel music on, not knowing that there was a boy in the ditch that needed Christ. Both the hummingbird And vultures fly in our nation's deserts. Vultures see nothing but rotting meat because that's what they're looking for. The hummingbird, they ignore the smelly flesh of dead animals. Instead, they look for colorful blossoms of desert plants. Vultures, they live on what was. They live on the past. They fill themselves with the dead and the gone. But the hummingbird lives on what is. They seek new life. They fill themselves with freshness and life. Each bird finds what it's looking for. So will you. You're going to find what you're looking for. If you're looking for the negative, it's there. If you're looking for discouragement, it's there. If you're looking for hate, It's all over the place. But if you're looking for good, good's there too. If you're looking for love, love is there. If you're looking for peace, peace is there. If you're looking for the positive, positive is also there. You can focus on what was, the dead and the gone, or you can focus on what is new and what is coming. And the best days are still ahead. Just a little lesson from Rudolph this morning. Would you stand with us today? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful for the love, for the mercy, for the grace of God. The Christmas story is a beautiful story. It's a story of of peace, joy, happiness. But Christmas also comes to an end 
with the death of that beautiful child. We call it Easter. But it also is a great story because it's the story of the resurrection, vindication. It is finished. And God is no longer against man. God is for man. And he loves you this morning. When you came in today, you should have received your emblems for communion. If you didn't receive these little packets, just raise your hand right now, and an usher will make sure that you get one this morning. So just keep your hand up, raise until an usher gets there. And this is the first Sunday of the month, and we always do communion on the first Sunday of the month. And I thought this morning how significant it is, especially in this message for communion today, because this tells us what Jesus did for us. It speaks of vindication. Can you say amen? We still need some more up, up front here, guys, if you have any more. And uh, I'm glad this morning that I've been vindicated through the blood of Jesus Christ. And today, you can be healed through the blood of Jesus Christ. You hear me this morning? There's healing in the blood of Jesus. Some of you maybe have already had the coronavirus and got over it, got your shot, whatever, and dealing with it. Well, we need to pray for those that that have it today. And I do believe this, ladies and gentlemen, or I wouldn't, if I, if I didn't believe the Bible, I wouldn't say this, but I believe the Bible. I believe that God is greater than coronavirus. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe it is so important that you get up every day and you plead the blood of Jesus over your life. You plead the blood of Jesus over your home. And plead the blood of Jesus over your church. Because there's victory in the blood of Jesus today. I'd like to have every head bowed and every eye closed, if you would. Just before we close this morning. I want to ask this question today to everyone in this room, because I don't know you all. There is one type of an individual that should refrain from taking communion this morning. And that is the person that has never given their life to Jesus. They never asked Jesus to come into their life. Because... How can you take of the emblems of the body and the blood of Christ if you've never given your life to Christ? But my prayer is this morning that 100% of this congregation will take communion today. That's why I want to give you a chance right now to give your life to Jesus. God is your friend this morning and He loves you. He loved you so much. As we mentioned this morning, He sent His Son to die for you. He sent His Son to envelop Himself in flesh Live as a man and die for your sins. And because he was God the third day, he rose victorious over the grave. And because he lives, we can live also. So this message of Christmas is not just about this life. It's about giving you hope in the life to come. And I wonder how many are here this morning and say, Pastor, I just feel like I'm at that dead end street. That how could God ever love me? How could God ever use me? How could God ever want me? Listen, he loved you. When you were born, and he knew you before you were born, and he loved you, and he's always loved you. And you're here this morning to hear this message and to hear this call to give your life to Christ. The only reason you're here to hear that is because God loves you, and he wanted you to hear that. I wonder how many are in this room and say, Pastor, today I want to give my life to Jesus. If that's you, I just want to know who I'm praying for. Put your hand in the air right now all over this room. Thank you. How many more? Thank you. Just keep it going up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you for all those hands this morning. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You can put them down. Say this prayer with me, everyone, if you would, especially those that raised your hand. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your son to die for me. I'm not insignificant. I'm the apple of your eye. You died on the cross for me and for my sins. And you love me as much as you love anyone else in this world. And today, I give you my life. Come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can live the way you want me to live. And I thank you for the hope I have in you. And because of you, someday I will meet you in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we're going to remember the body of Christ. 
Jesus said that they, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body which was broken for you. I think it's so important that when we come to this part of a service, communion, that we're very humble and sober and serious before God. Because we need to remember him. That's what the thing he said when he left. I just want you to remember me. Never forget what I did for you. His body was broken. It was bruised. His blood was shed for our sins, for your healing this morning. And when we pray this morning, we take this, I want you to believe for your healing, whatever it might be in your body, a, a back, a leg, you know, that's, that's not working right, or whether it's something, nervousness in your body, or anything, depression, anxiety, whatever it might be, the flu, a cold, I believe God can heal you. Because the Bible says it can. And I've seen people healed in services just like this. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, for these emblems this morning. I pray your blessing upon this wafer which represents your precious body that was broken for us. I pray, Lord, for this juice that represents your blood. God, it's not going to turn into your body. It's not going to turn into your blood this morning. You died on the cross of Calvary over 2,000 years ago, and you said then, it is finished. But you always wanted us to remember what you did, the price that you paid. And I pray, Lord, for anyone in here this morning that needs a healing, that you would heal their body as we take this in remembrance of your precious blood, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. At the end of the supper, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take this and eat in remembrance of my body, which was broken for you. Let's eat in remembrance of the body of Christ this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And then at the end, he took his cup and he held it up. And he said, this is a new covenant which was written for you and I in the very blood of Jesus Christ. Let's drink in remembrance of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Can you just thank God this morning? Thank Him for what He's done for you. Thank Him for healing. Thank Him for victory. Thank Him that you have a hope in heaven. Thank Him for His love and His grace and His mercy. We love you, Lord. We give you praise. We give you honor. We thank you for all that you've done. God, you truly are a great, great God. And you're so good to us. I pray, Lord, your blessing on your people this morning. Keep your blood over them. Give them traveling mercies. Lord, I pray, Lord, that anyone that feels sick today, Lord, that they're going to leave here feeling better in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, your blessing on those that are unable to be with us today. Touch their physical bodies, I pray, as well. God, give each and every one traveling mercies. And we thank you, Lord, for the day that we're going to meet you in heaven. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord.